Good morning and welcome to Christian Baptist Church. If this is your first time joining with us, uh, we're really glad that you've taken the time to connect with us uh, here on both Facebook Live um, and on Zoom Church, our regular Sunday morning worship time together. Uh, I want to begin this morning by saying thank you to so many of you who uh, held me and my family up last weekend in prayer. Um, I had a bit of a scare um, last week ago, last Thursday, I thought I was having a heart attack and uh, asked my daughter to quickly take me down to the hospital. She took me down and I spent the night in Emerge as they ran a plethora of tests and they're still running some more tests, but it seems as though my heart is okay. Um, and uh, praise the Lord, literally, literally, this morning is the first morning I've woken with absolutely no pain. Um, and I am so excited about the message that's ahead of us, that we would know Christ, that we would know Jesus. So I'm looking forward to bringing that message from the Word of God to you later on this morning. Uh, and I'm looking forward to what God might do um, right here on Zoom Church, uh, whether you're watching us live or whether it's going to be a recording at a later time. Uh, and I believe that this message is for each and every one of us. So God bless you. Um, I'm just going to ask Grace if she would open our service this morning in prayer. Um, just before we begin, um, I'd like to read from Psalm 66, verses 1 to 4 and 16 to 20. Everything on earth shout with joy to God. Praise his glorious name. Honor him with songs of praise and tell him your works are wonderful. Your great power makes your enemies bow down in fear before you. Let the whole world worship you and let everyone sing praises to your name. All you people who worship God, come and I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him for help and I praised him. If I had been hiding sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened to me. But God did listen to me. He heard my prayer. Praise God. He did not turn away from me. He listened to my prayer. He continues to show his love to me. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just give you all our praise and our gratitude for bringing us all here through this week and bringing us to, to Zoom Church. Father, we had so many things happening throughout the week and we came to you and we gave you our prayers and you listened to our prayers and we thank you so much for that, God. And now, Lord, especially, um, we thank you that Andrew is here with us this morning, that he's feeling better and you heard our prayers and you are healing him. And we pray for your continued, um, continued protection and healing of him and be with Pastor Andrew as he preaches this morning. Father God, we ask that you help us to listen. Lord, you have a special message for each one of us who's here today. Help us to be open to learning what you have for us today. We pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
I'm going to read from Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Thank you. Two men bring an offering to the Lord, one of the fruit of the ground, the other the firstborn of his flock. God accepts one and rejects the other. Why? Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. The word tells us clearly that the offering Abel brought was the firstborn of his flock. But it doesn't say that Cain brought the first fruits of his crops. It simply says, in the process of time, Cain brought an offering. Cain harvested his crops and over time gathered enough to bring an offering. It was an offering on Cain's terms. God accepted Abel's offering because it was the first of his increase. Cain's offering was rejected, but wasn't the first of his. Giving the first to God requires faith. When a firstborn lamb is born in a flock, it's not possible to know how many more lambs that you might produce. But Abel gave his firstborn lamb in faith, whereas Cain made sure he had enough for himself before giving to God. Many of us treat God the same way as Cain, making sure we have enough money before we see if there's anything left for God. Even if we give from what's left over, God can't accept the offering because it's not the first fruit. Other stories emphasize this truth. In the account of the fall of Jericho, the Lord gave strict instructions that the Israelites were not to keep any of the spoils from Jericho. All of it belonged to him, the Lord declared. Jericho belonged to the Lord because it was the first city conquered in the Promised Land. It was the first fruits. God withheld his blessing from Israel when one man took some of the spoils for himself. The first belongs to God. There was much more at stake than money when Abraham offered his firstborn son Isaac. When God asked for his son, Abraham didn't wait to have ten sons before giving Isaac. He gave the first when he only had one to give. Abraham had only the promise of having more sons. It took faith for Abraham to offer Isaac, faith that God respected and blessed. And God did the same for us. He gave his first in the form of his son, his first and only begotten son, who was given to us while we were still sinners. God gave Jesus in faith that we might one day give our lives to him. The gift of his son, came before the blessing of our repentance and salvation. We give our first fruits in much the same way. Before we see the blessing of God, we give it in faith. Giving the first fruits of your income says to God, I recognize you first. I am putting you first in my life. 
and I trust you to take care of the rest. Okay, please join me in prayer for the tithes and offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the, all that you provide and uh, that you give to us each and every day and that uh, we can trust in you each and every moment of every day. We thank you for all of our daily bread, that you are faithful and that Lord, that, that our tithes and offerings are just a token and an, a symbol of our worship. Uh, it's an act of worship and our faith in you and that you are you give us the privilege of having us work with you, Lord. It's not that you need money to accomplish your will, but that you give us that opportunity to work together with you in doing so. And that it reminds us that uh, you are faithful and that all we have and all we are comes from you. We just ask that you would bless these, our tithes and offerings, and that they would be put to good use to the furthering of your kingdom. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jeff. So we're at the beginning of a brand new series, and the series is called I Want to Know Jesus. And my goal is to help you to take Jesus out of the box of your current understanding of him so that he can become all that he really is in our lives. So grab your Bible. We're going to start right off the start with Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 20. Luke 9, 18 to 20. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, some said John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets of long ago, come back to life. But what about you? Notice how personal this question is, Jesus asked. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Questions. Life is full of questions. Would you prefer regular or decaf? Leaded or unleaded? Hot or mild? Coke or Pepsi? That's right. Now, these are easy questions, but there's many bigger questions, too, like, what are you going to do when you get out of school? What career do you want to pursue? Or when you're going to marry, who will you marry? How much will I need for retirement? Or now that I'm retired, can God still use me? Well, these are important questions, but there's one question that we're all going to have to deal with one day. It's the question asked 2,000 years ago by the carpenter from Galilee, and he still asks it to you and me today. Who do you say I am? This morning, we're going to get started on this new series, I Want to Know Jesus. And the series has big potential because it can change your life in a radical way, no matter who you are or how old you are. Getting to know Jesus more will transform us. You know, transform. Like we're talking caterpillar start, butterfly when we're done. Transformation. Some of the people in this series is going to, that we're going to see right here in front of us on Zoom Church are going to radically change. And it's going to happen right before our eyes. Some of those changed people might be your neighbors. They might be your co-workers, family, friends, people we care about for right here on Main Street in Newmarket. It might even change you. Now, how can I be so confident in that? How can I be actually cocky in that? Listen, it's because of what Jesus said during his final week here on earth. And his life it was recorded to us in John chapter 12, verse 32. He said, as for me, if I'm lifted up from this earth, I will draw all people to me. And I trust his word. Jesus was talking specifically about being lifted up on the cross. But... I believe that he can still be lifted up in our lives today by glorifying him. 
in our lives, in our church, in our worship on Sundays and beyond every day of the week, in our speech and in our lives. And when we lift Jesus up, people will be drawn to him. Listen, this is not they might, they will be drawn to him. So today, I want to start by just asking, making three simple statements. And the first statement is this. You may not like this one, but you don't fully know Jesus. I'm going to say it again. You don't know Jesus. Now, how does that make you feel when I say it? Are you confused, angry, offended, insecure? Do you agree with it? So let me tell you a story about a man who had many personal encounters with Jesus. He spent three years one-on-one -on -one with Jesus being taught by him in Arabia. Jesus asked this man to personally represent him to the Gentiles. And Jesus gave this guy the power to heal, the power to perform miracles, and even to raise the dead. This guy totally and radically gave his life for Jesus. He was willing to go without food and water to be beaten, betrayed, whipped, stoned, and put in prison. All for one reason. It was to live for Jesus. Even more, Jesus asked this guy to write 13 books in the New Testament. This man believed in and lived for Jesus. He believed that if he was going to die serving Jesus, it was completely worth it, and it was for his gain. That man wrote these words, and they're recorded for us this morning in Philippians chapter 3. So if you go Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. <clears throat> Philippians 3, 7 to 9 says this, but what Ever were gains to me, I consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. L listen, did you hear that? Can you see what the Apostle Paul is saying here? He is saying that he has given up all of the stuff of comforts that used to be his vain attempt to measure up to God's goodness. And now he simply accepts the righteousness that comes through faith, through knowing Jesus. And then Paul Ooh, says, wow, the words in verse 10, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, the participation in his suffering, and becoming like him in his death. He didn't say, I already know Jesus, although he did. He said, I want to know Jesus. If Paul's life came down to knowing Jesus, and if Paul understood that despite all that he did know, he still didn't fully know him, how can we say that we know Jesus? Listen, I'm not saying that you don't know anything about Jesus and that Jesus hasn't changed your life. Because for many of us here, we can say that Jesus has changed our life. He has made such a difference in our life. What I know of Jesus has changed my life. I'm not the same person that I was when I first met Jesus. And by his grace, I won't be the same person tomorrow. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you're not the same person you were the first time you met him either. And this is good. But make no mistake, there is so much more to knowing Jesus than any one of us on Zoom Church could ever imagine. Listen, if you want to know Jesus, 
and you let your next the next few weeks impact your life, then you're going to have, in fact, you're going to take Jesus off this flannel board picture and your current understanding of who he is. You're going to take him out of the safe, neat box of your preconceived, limited notion and with passion search for him again. What you know and have experienced so far is good. I'm not trying to criticize you, but listen, there's so much more for us. Life is too short to waste. We will never know Jesus by relying on other people's preconceived notions and theories. We need to take a look at Jesus for ourselves again. We need to wipe away some of the images of the last 20 centuries and see Jesus in full high definition. I want us to see Jesus for who he really is in his fullness, the man who walked Main Street Israel and had dirty, even stinky feet. Listen, I know Jesus some. But there's so much more to this indescribable, uncontainable, unrelenting, all-powerful God that I do not know. And I want to know him more. I want to know the Christ. And I want to experience him alive in my life and alive in his church. Listen. It's a dangerous and costly thing to believe that you've already figured Jesus out. Just ask the Pharisees of the first century. Think about it. Jesus, their Messiah, literally stood right before their eyes. And they didn't even know it. In fact, they couldn't see him. Why? Because they had already defined the Christ in their own minds like a permanent marker on a whiteboard or like some flannel board Sunday school image. In Luke 7, these religious guys watched as Jesus forgave the woman who anointed his dirty, stinky feet with perfume and then had the audacity to wipe them with her hair but they refused to ask for the same forgiveness for their sins. They were in, a, in the very presence of the one who could and would forgive them every one of the sins that they'd ever committed or ever were going to commit, and they didn't even think to ask him. They thought they were too good. Why? Because the Jesus on their flannel board of understanding would never consider letting a woman like that touch him. Jesus was not the Messiah they wanted or understood. Jesus was more than their understanding of him. Listen, Zoom Church, it's a dangerous and costly thing for you and I to believe that we have Jesus figured out. The second statement that I want to make for you this morning is this. Jesus is a hard guy to pin down. Now, there's an interesting book about Jesus by a guy named Leonard Sweet. The book's called Jesus Drives Me Crazy. Great title, eh? Well, the premise of the book is just that. Jesus drives his followers bananas. He is so unpredictable, so hard to pin down. Just when they think that they've got Jesus figured out, he would pull a 180 on them. Jesus said that the way up was down. The way out is in. The way to be first is to be last. And the way to success is to be a servant. The way of strength is weakness. The way to life was death. Do you want to find yourself? Then forget about yourself. Do you want to be great? Then become the least. Do you want to be free? Well, then make God your master. And God's power is made perfect in what? In our weakness. And look at what Jesus did. The creator God left perfect, glorious, indescribable heaven to be one like you and me. The king 
came to serve. The mighty one gave his life for sinners. How do you pin a guy like that down? He is so unpredictable. I mean, what good shepherd would risk 99 saved sheep to find one that was lost? What employer would pay last minute wages, sorry, first minute wages to the last minute workers who came and worked all day? What father would throw a huge party to welcome home a son who had just finished blowing his son's entire inheritance? What wedding guest would wait till the end of the party to surprise the host with a wedding gift of about 180 gallons of the best wine they would ever taste? Seriously. What kind of man would forgive and pray for the very men driving seven inch spikes into his body? Jesus would. If Jesus had never lived, we would never have been able to invent him. You just can't put him in a box and you can't tame, control, or shape him to fit into your flannel board stories and much less to fit into your limited image of him. And when we make Jesus fit our ideas of him, we obscure who he really was and who he really is today. We miss the point of his life and his message, not to, mess it, not to mention we miss the point of his death and resurrection. When we make Jesus to be just like us, when we do that, he, we completely miss the opportunity to be transformed by the real Jesus, to become more like him, to live the life he designed for us before the creation of the world. Now, there's a story about a grandfather who took his seven-year-old son to uh, an old church at Christmas time to see the nativity scene. And when the young boy looked into the manger, he asked his grandpa, he said, Grandpa, when is the baby Jesus ever going to grow up? Listen, it's time for us, yes, us, you and me, to take Jesus out of the safe manger. It's time for us to stop trying to pin him down. In fact, it's time for us to unclaw and untame the Lion of Judah. We need to move past our cliches and past our stereotypes of Jesus and then take a fresh look at him. It's time to see him with a new pair of glasses and embrace Paul's cry as our own. I want to know Jesus. The last statement I want to make to you this morning is this. We need to fully know Jesus. Okay, I know I've read this passage several times over the past few weeks, but this passage means so much to me. I want to draw you back to it. Matthew chapter 14. Grab your Bibles there. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. There's so much to learn about Jesus in this passage that I just, I have to bring you back to it. Starting at verse 22, this is what the Bible says. Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and to start back across the lake. But he stayed until he had sent the crowds away. Then he went up onto the mountain where he could be alone and pray. Later that evening, he was still there. By this time, the boat was a long way from shore, and it was going hard against the wind because the waves were, toss were tossing it around. A little while before the morning, Jesus came walking on the water towards the disciples. When they saw him, they thought he was a ghost. They were terrified, and they started screaming. At once... Jesus said to them, don't worry, I am Jesus, do not be afraid. And Peter replied, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come now, Jesus said. 
Peter then got out of the boat and started walking on the water towards him. But when Peter saw the strong wind and how afraid, he became afraid and he started sinking, save me, Lord, he shouted. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and helped Peter up. And he asked, why do you have such little faith? Why do you doubt? When Jesus and Peter got into the boat, the wind died down. The men in the boat worshipped Jesus and said, you really are the son of God. Why were the disciples terrified? Why did they scream? It's because they were terrified. They screamed and they stayed in the boat because they couldn't figure out this guy who was walking on the water in the middle of those crashing waves. They didn't know who he was. Listen, about nine years ago, this passage really hit me. In fact, it hit me like it had never done before. I was in a deep time of depression. I was not only angry with life, honestly, I was angry with God. But as I read that passage, I could almost hear Jesus speak the words to me, don't worry, I'm Jesus, don't be afraid. I so needed those words. I was in a boatload of depression and taking on water fast. Nothing was safe there. I knew that there was a better way to live because I'd lived better. But my depression had kept me huddled up in this boat. And I felt like I was surrounded by crashing waves of fear, of doubt, insecurity, failure. My sin, my doubts, and my discouragement. I wanted off the boat so badly I hated the wind and the waves when they crashed over me. But when I heard Jesus say through this passage of scripture, don't worry, I'm Jesus. Don't be afraid. I began to get out of my boat again and trust Jesus in a whole new way. Jesus came to me and spoke to me. Listen, I am completely convinced that we need to know Jesus and who he really is. We need to know him more than our Sunday school flannel board images. Why? Because when we know who he is, we're willing to get out of the boat that we're drowning in. Listen, the disciples were drowning in the boat. Jesus was safe on the water. He calls them to a place of safety, and they chose the drowning boat. When we know who he is, we're willing to get out of the boat. We will walk on water. We'll lose our fears. We'll stop our worrying, and we'll begin to live the life that we were created to live in Jesus. Listen, according to John 1 verse 4, which we read every year at Christmas time, in him is life. And that life is the light of men. That's a promise for you. It's a promise for me. And Jesus said on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane in John 14, 6, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No man can come to the Father except by me. Listen, if you think there's another way or another possibility or your good deeds or your great efforts, I don't care whether you're the, the lowliest person or the greatest leader that's ever walked on this earth. Jesus is the way. And when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane in John 17, 3, he said this. He said, now this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Listen, we just finished a series on finding freedom in Jesus. So why are we still afraid to know the real Jesus? Why do we still worry and have doubts about our worth, our value, and our purpose? Why do we still have some of these struggles and the same temptations? 
And even though there is no safety inside the boat we're drowning in, why do we choose to stay there? It's because we don't fully know who the guy walking on the water really is. We don't fully know Jesus. And that's why we're doing this series. I want to see Jesus. I want to see him in a newer, bigger, fresher, cleaner way than I have ever seen him before. I don't want you to be safe in the boat. I don't want you to be a casual, safe, on-the-shore believer, follower of Jesus. And neither does he. He's calling you and me today to walk on water. Oh, come on, Andrew. That's way too dramatic. You're sounding charismatic. We're a Baptist church. It doesn't fit our paradigm. I don't care if it fits a paradigm. I care it fits the word of God. He has called us to come to him. Will you come? And when I speak of seeing Jesus, I'm not necessarily talking about seeing him with our eyeballs in our head. I'm talking about seeing him with the eyes of our hearts, with faith. Do you know that your heart has eyes? We're going to sing a song about that at the end of this service. But just hang on for a minute. Listen to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 18 to 20. Grab your Bible and turn there. Ephesians 3, 18 to 20. Paul says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Did you catch that? Paul is praying for you. And he's praying that the eyes of your heart will be open so that you can see the hope that Jesus has called you to. The riches of your inheritance in Jesus and the great power available to you because you believe. There is a way of seeing that is much greater than mere physical sight. The gospel writer makes it clear that sometimes, even though people saw Jesus physically, they didn't really see him. Look at what Jesus said about the people who would li just listen to him tell the story of the farmer and the seed in Matthew chapter 13, 13. It's a verse that, that, that grabs your attention if you stop to think about it. Matthew 13, 13, Jesus says, though seeing, they do not see. All they saw was a man named Jesus with their eyeballs in their head and not the eyes of their heart. Anyone can read the stories of Jesus and see the pictures painted by the words of those who knew him. But not everyone sees the truth, the beauty, and the measureless value of Jesus. Maybe you see a myth. Maybe foolishness. Maybe you're offended like a child forced to look at a painting at the McMichael Art Gallery when you'd far rather be looking at a comic strip. You cannot savor Jesus without seeing Jesus with faith. And when you see something that is as true, as beautiful, as valuable as him, you savor him. You treasure it, you admire it, and you prize it. Spiritual seeing is spiritual savoring. If you don't savor Jesus, you haven't really seen Jesus. Oh, now there's an offensive line, isn't it? Listen, I've been a Christian for years. I get along just fine coming to church on Sunday morning, you know, the way we used to do it. We came in, we sat down, we sang some songs, 
The preacher preached. He didn't offend us. We got up. We walked out. We left. We lived our lives. But I'm telling you today that if you don't savor Jesus, you've never seen Jesus. If you don't apprise him above everything else, you haven't grasped his full value. And listen, here's the point. I want you to see Jesus more. I'm not trying to criticize you. If there's any criticism, it goes to this guy here. I want you to see Jesus more, and I want to see Jesus more. It's the best thing I could ever wish for you. So it's done. We're off. We've cast our lines in obedience. We've got into the sail. We've headed straight into the storms of life. We're on a journey as old as time itself. A journey to seek and to see the unseen one. And when we see him, when we see Jesus in all of his glory, what he might actually do right here on Main Street, we will savor, we will delight. We'll be thrilled by him. We'll praise him and prize him above everything else. And because of that, we will reflect his glory just like the moon reflects the sun. 2 Corinthians 13, 8 says this. All of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. God is inviting you, Zoom Church. He's inviting me this morning. It's a God invitation to see Jesus. Will you open the eyes of your heart? Will you please open the eyes of your heart? Let's pray. God, what a challenge from your word. What a challenge from Paul that we would open the eyes of our heart and see Jesus. The audacity for Paul to say that he wanted to know Christ as though it wasn't something he'd already known, that he wasn't already his best, most prized possession. And God, if Paul needed to know you more, and if he wanted to know you more, oh, how we need to know you more. God, you've called us here for 198 years on Main Street. And you've called us to a mission that touches the lives of the people on our main streets, whether it's here or whatever street it is that we live on. You have called us to make a difference in this day, not in some other day, not when I get a degree, not when I retire because I'm too busy at work, not when I have more free time. It's for today, your call. In fact, the book of Hebrews says so many times, Today, if you hear my voice, today, do not harden your hearts. God, strip away any of this message that's been Andrew. Strip away any of my uh, speech or anything that's tripped people up. God, I want people to see Jesus. And I want them to have a holy passion to listen to see, and to obey. And with the words of Paul, I pray that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of God's glorious inheritance in all of the saints and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe in Jesus. Oh, God. Open the eyes of our heart. We want to see Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. my heart
auntie see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you Listen, I don't want to sound all crazy and, and charismatic to you because it scares the wits out of me, but I actually believe that God wants to do something in our midst in this day. I actually have something written on the wall in my office. It, it's four letters. It's the word nuts. Now, listen, in my family, nuts are not a good thing. We're, we got four kids or three kids that are allergic to nuts. But this is what nuts stands for. Never underestimate the spirit. Listen, I don't know what it is that God is going to do in our day, but I do know this one thing full well. God wants to do more amongst us. The question is, are we willing to follow him wherever he leads us? For those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, I'm really glad that you've taken the time this morning and joined us. What we do typically right now in our service is we take time to pray for each other because we believe that God in his amazing grace actually responds to us when we pray. And he loves to listen to us pray. In fact, the Bible says that he inhabits the prayers of his people. So if you'd like to join with us on Zoom Church next week, we'd love to have you come in and, and join us in prayer together. Uh, if not, please feel free to send us an email at the church, uh, and we would be glad to be able to bring your prayer request before uh, the group of friends and family uh, here on Zoom Church. God bless you, Facebook Live. Uh, you'll be dismissed and, and cut from the line now.